Yeah. 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 yeah, some people on Zoom, okay. Yes. Okay, um, so I guess I would just ask you overall, like what, what do you think the main theme? This is a tough question, because I don't even know if I know the answer. I, I, I have an answer in my head, um, but like it's a, hard, it's a hard thing to answer. What is the, like what would you say the main theme of Shir Shirin, Song of Songs, for those who are familiar with it or for those who are able to kind of look over it a little bit before our class? Just, uh, yeah. Deborah. I mean, you can talk to, to us, maybe not to each other. Main thing really is. Yeah, uh, but just high by. I think that the main thing basically, it, it goes all over the It's a number of themes, but the main thing ultimately is love. It's a love of your ships, love of your country, love of a woman, love of Torah. It's got, it's love. Okay. Anybody else uh, on Zoom want to offer a thought or anybody who kind of reviewed it a little bit before our class? Rabbi Yogev? Yes. It's Debbie Bear. Hi. Um, this is a funny story. I was uh, studying um, Tanakh, although of course it was called the Old Testament when I was studying it in college with our, uh, our spiritual advisor who was a Methodist minister for whom I also babysat all year. And um, his kids, obviously, not him. And he called me his Jewish barometer. And we were going to study Shira Shireem. And he says, you know, can anybody tell us what the meaning of this is? Oh, okay. I, said, oh, I said, oh, yes. I said, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's the love of, you know, the Jewish people for God. He looked at me and he said, oh, come on. He says, wow. he says the rabbis were sitting there night after night after night after night studying. He says, do you really think it was an allegory or do you think it might have really been a love story that just kept them going on every night of studying? So that, that's, my, uh, <laughs> that's my good story about Shira Shireen from college. Okay, that's, that is a good story. Um, it's interesting, we are supposed to open up the class the same way. I'm going to go a little bit of a different direction. Um, first off, so why I'm asking this question because it is a complicated question with a complicated answer. The sages answer, if you ask the, the Chazal, um, and we're going to see other important um, rabbis and interpreters, they say that the book Song of Songs is an allegory. It's an allegory. If you read the simple reading of the text, you don't necessarily see this, but it's an allegory for Am Yisrael's love relationship with Hashem and their, and the, un, un, and the un, un, unity between them through the Torah. That's basically the allegory. So if, if you'd like, I'll just, I can show you a little bit of this. I'll show, in a little bit, I'll show you this. But if you open up the art scroll, this is the text that we're using. That's why we're not using this today. I'm not against this explanation. I actually really like it. Uh, that's why, where I differ perhaps from, uh, from your teacher, uh, Debbie. Um, I, your, I guess, the lecturer. Um, I really like the explanation. I find it very, I feel, find it very um, comforting to read the text that way to see it, how much God loves us, how much we struggle sometimes in our connection with the Shem. I feel like it's like actually makes the connection much more, um, much more like natural, much brings it more home. Like when you see our connection, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, sometimes we struggle, sometimes God's coming after for us, sometimes we're seeking out a Shem. I find it like, um, I find it empowering to know that the text is kind of affirming the fact that it's not always like a, it's not always a clear path uh, towards loving a Shem. There's ups and downs. I find it very valuable. I also love it how Hashem's like seeking Am Yisrael, always wanting the loving connection. So I find that like extremely valuable allegory. So I'm not going to teach it today based on the allegory. I'm going to teach it based on the simple reading of the text. But I want to say like I don't. I, I really appreciate the allegorical explanation. Um, so like, what is so? What is the meaning? So we mentioned uh, Deborah mentioned Devorah or Deborah. Devorah. Devorah mentioned that uh, the the song the song of songs is about love. Anybody want to offer like more of a um, you know, like more of a uh, nuanced or detailed um, description, like what, like what about the love? I know you mentioned that that is the overall theme. The, 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 the yeah. other major thing is that I don't think anybody's going to mention is that it's supposed to be the love letters, love poetry between Solomon and the queen of Sheba. Okay. That's, and Makeda, Makeda and he were lovers. So the dark and comedy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's all a relationship. Thanks. On Zoom, anybody wanna? Um... Yeah, I'd like to mention nope. the fact. This Hi. is Emily. Hi. This is Emily talking. 
Hi. Hi. Uh, realistically, when I first started to read it, I think it was a man looking at a stunning woman, and I felt it was very lustful. Yes. So you're not alone. Right. So there was a time in Jewish history where the rabbis, the rabbi, Talmudic rabbis, felt that same feeling, and they said, yo, we can't put this in our corpus. This is a, this is like a, um, I guess a, I don't know, like a text that's uh, very uh, provocative. Mm -hmm. And Rabbi Akiva was very, uh, he was very um, uh, important, a very important voice when it comes to this, because he said, uh, you don't, you're not understanding Song of Songs the right way. It has very deep secrets in it, and we should leave it in. And they left it in. But if you read it in a simple, based on a simple reading, it can feel like a very provocative or um, like, I don't know, R-rated text. Um, and it seems like weird that it's included in the Tanakh um, because it's not even talking necessarily about uh, our forefathers, about our foremothers. It's not stories about uh, our uh, our heroes of the Tanakh. So those are some questions that, that arise when it comes to the text. And the question I actually want to ask today, uh, what we're gonna focus on is how do you cultivate love and what are some obstacles to love? I think, that that's what the text is about. And I'm going to try to show you how that plays out in the text. So let's just like, um, let's do the second question. That's actually one of our main focuses. What would you say are some obstacles to, to romantic love or to like, to love between a, a spousal relationship or overall? Like what would be some central obstacles? Uh, you could just throw out some ideas. Maybe we could go with Zoom first. I see Chris thinking very hard. Right. Oh, just a minute. <laughs> that was not Chris. <laughs> um, <laughs> obstacles to love, um, you know, communication or a lack thereof is an obstacle of, of, of understanding one another and your intentions. Mm -hmm. Well, anybody else? Sheila, did you, was that, did you want to share something or? Okay. Who else has a, who else wants to offer a thought? Yeah, thought. Well, <clears throat> the text itself would seem to indicate being hidden from him. Uh, so what does that, that mean? Like, he's, searching, not having, he's searching for her. He's searching for her. And so, so, so like, what does that mean being hidden? Like that you're, well, uh, well, that, if you have to search for somebody, they're not out in the open uh, for you. There are times in the, in the text where they are. And he describes her. Uh, like you swipe right, but they swipe left and you can't find each other. No. Something like that. <laughs> I'm trying to bring up a modern example. <laughs> um, there's also, you know, okay, I have like a lot to say on that. But, um, so, okay, who else has another? What will be like another central obstacle to love? I mean, there's probably a lot of them. Oh, yeah. Respect. Respect. So if you lose respect, for the other, it's hard to properly love them. Any others uh, on Zoom? Background, your background, your traditions that you've grown up with. You could just be very different people and that can make it difficult. Yes, very <laughs> difficult. Your family background, your where you come from, what your individual goals are. All of those can be obstacles, but that goes in with the communication part. Mm -hmm. And it's very, it's very slow and very hard. Love has to be nurtured very much so, and very carefully. It's a lot of work. I think also trust ah, is something time. that's very important. Mm -hmm. If there's no trust, it's uh, you don't have that binding factor. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But these are all good ones. Uh, anyone? Yeah. Uh, commitment. Lee. Commitment. You want to expand on that a little bit? Or? Well, you would like to think that. Did you hear? Uh, one one at partner home? is yeah. is committed to the relationship as much as the other partner. Ah, That's good. Yes. Good. yes. So the reason why I'm having this class, I just want to ask all of you, all of you have been married much longer than me for some advice. That's basically, no, I'm just joking. No, but <laughs> what not to do? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but, uh, tell those jokes. <laughs> yeah, tell those jokes. Um, so yeah, commitment, um, kind of being being there, being and available. That's the allegory to the Jewish people in God. Okay, can you explain? Well, 
commitment to Torah, commitment to the mitzvah. Yeah, so that's a central a way of theme. life. That's a central theme in the text. So you mentioned um, not finding each other. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's the commitment, committing to each other. So the text really is like, um, we're going to see it's like kind of like a back and forth between um, commitment and not finding each other. And the question is like, what is, what's the, what's the message here? So I want to, um, I want to kind of shift our, anyone want to share any other thoughts on Zoom? Um, okay. So I want to shift our focus now to our source sheet and then uh, hopefully to the text. Um, but before there's two introductory pieces that I want to uh, discuss before we get into that. Um, yeah. um, again, uh, this is our source sheet. All everything's here, and I don't know if you've been noticing. I've been sending out the playlist. If you have, if you have some extra time, you can go back over our classes, or if you missed some, um, uh, you can you can find them all in the playlist, and also you can find all the source sheets here. So basically, you just tap on this, and it'll bring you to our class. Um, we're starting today a relationships unit. Okay, um, how, to, how to cultivate love. That's Shira Shireen. So next week, it, I, I want to do friendship, but I might do social action because MLK Day. We're meeting on MLK Day. Okay, um, their school is closed, but the the school's open, and um, I don't know. I just, hopefully, you'll be able to join me for that. Unless you're you okay. Teachers or okay, I think that was my thinking behind it. Um, teaching is not happening, but teachers are working. Okay. Um, what? We're learning, not teaching. Yeah. Okay, so that's okay. Hopefully, you won't be too tired from learning by the time. Okay, of course not. Okay. Um, so, I want to do either friendship, which should be David and Jonathan, and talk about like what is the like friendship in Judaism? Like, what's was what Jesus say that? Or social action? Not sure. And then I want to do where is God? What does that mean? I want to do Psalms. Go through Psalms, see where, where is God according to King David, and kind of go and learn how to learn Psalms. I think that would be like an awesome class. Then, then we don't have class. I'm going to be away that week. And then March 20th, which is much later, I'm just going to put on your radar, is a Haggadah workshop. Okay. Um, I have some new material. I've been uh, doing, already doing some reading for that. So I'm excited for that. It's like an hour. We're going to get through a lot of stuff in the Haggadah. It should be good. Okay. We went through some of our questions. And we're, we're also going to talk about why is it in the Tanakh? Okay, and why do we read it on Passover? Okay, so on Passover, and on every holiday, you read a different uh, Megillah, and on Passover, we read Shir Shirin. So we're going to keep all these questions in mind mm -hmm. as we get through the text. What's the connection between Shir Shirin and Pesach? Um, there, there are multiple layers to that connection. On a simple level, Hashem brought us close, and we had a romantic connection with Hashem. Uh, that's a simple level, but there, there are other deeper levels as well. Um, Okay, so to start off, I just want to talk about the two ways to read the text. Um, there's, the, there's the allegorical approach versus um, the literal reading. Yeah, and I talked about this a little bit, but I just want to show you. The book Art Scroll. Let's take a look at Art Scroll. I have, I brought a copy. I brought a little bit of it here. I don't know if you can see it. Okay, I'm going to try to compare. Okay, um, here's verse 11. Which chapter is this? Chapter, probably chapter four, it says, just read some of the text. This is our scroll. This is the allegorical approach, right? The sweetness of Torah drips from your lips. Okay, it doesn't say that. It just says the sweet. I have to find it. Sure, sure. Uh, if you have, if you want to open up, you can. I have ten ops over here. Those at home can just uh, listen. Right. Sure, sure, sure. It's right after Job. Okay, this should be chapter four, probably. Okay, this is page 1691 in the Tanakh. You have it at home um, if you want to take a copy here. The text says, um, verse 11 in Hebrew says, uh, the sweetness of your lips uh, uh, has, I actually have that in English text. Give me a second, let's do it like this. <laughs> This is the arts kind of work. Here's a, a layers where here we go. Okay. Let's go to chapter four. Chapter four, verse 11. Here's just like I just took the text from um, um, Safaria. Let's compare these for a second. Yeah. Here's chapter four, okay, verse 11. Uh, okay.
of stratifying its diverse examples. Uh, okay, sweetness drops from your lips, O bride. Okay, and here it says the sweetness of Torah drops from your lips. Okay, it doesn't say that in the in the in its simple text. Honey and milk are under your tongue. Honey and milk, it lies under your tongue. Your very garments are scented with precepts like the scent of Lebanon. That's that's the art scroll. As chaste as a garden lock, my sister, a bride, a spring locked up, a fountain sealed. Your least gifted ones are pomegranate orchard with luscious fruit, henna with nard. This actually isn't the best example, but um, here, this is better. Chapter five, sorry. Here, chapter five. This is fine, here. I've come to my garden. Okay, this is first, this is 1693. In Hebrew, it says, in the art school, it says, to your tabernacle dedication, my sister, O bride, I came as if to my garden. Okay, it just says, I come to my garden, my own bride. I have plucked my myrrh and spice. I gather my myrrh with my spice from your princely incense. I accepted your unbidden as well as your bidden offerings to me. I drank your libations, pure as milk. Eat my beloved priests. Drink and become God intoxicated, O friends. That's the art scroll. Here's the, here's the uh, it's literal reading. This is, um, eat of my honey, honeycomb, drunk my wine and my milk, eat lovers and drink, drink deep of love. <laughs> so so it's, not a, it's not discussing the temple at all. It's just discussing a loving connection between a couple. And it keeps going on like that. So I just wanted to bring you one example. This is the whole text is, 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 is um, depicted this way in the art scroll. And it makes for a nice reading. It's just not the literal reading. Okay. So you got you got the feel for that a little bit, right? Um, at one, yeah. To, to me, I, I don't know about anybody else in this room, but to me, the problem with that is a whole different problem, because Christianity interprets it exactly the way they're trying to. The love of Christ for His Church, and that's just not the way this reads. Um, I'm gonna leave the Christ. Comment. I, I don't. That's a lot. Probably to unpack right now. But um, I agree with you. People take great issue with the allegorical approach. Um, the, so I'm, uh, let me show you what, what what some. This is so. This is what. This is how they explained it. Um, Art Scroll explained it this way. Um, here, the song. The song is an allegory. It is a duet of love between God and Israel. Its verses are so saturated with meaning that nearly every one of the major commentators finds new themes in its beautiful but cryptic words. I'll agree, however, that the true and simple meaning of Shir Shim is the allegorical meaning, so it's, which is a very strong claim to say the simple reading is the allegorical one. But, but the, the, the editors of, of Art Scroll are not the only ones who say that. Um, Rabbi Soloveitchik says that. Rabbi Norman Lamb says that was the, like the one of the central rabbis at YU. He says the first striking fact about Song of Songs is the way it's understood to the Jewish tradition. It does not all mean that what the words say. Outwardly, it is a love song, but Judaism is maintained that Shir Shirim must not be regarded as a pastoral love song. Rather, a song of intense devotion between Israel and God. Right. So, other, basically, the way we should read it is through allegory. Now, there's others who read it through the simple reading of what it says. Um, Rav Yuval Shur Shurlow um, has something to say on that. Sorry, I'm kind of going fast. Um, he said like this, a direct unmediated reading of Tanakh prior to turning to the commentaries also allows for a unique encounter of each individual with the word of God. Every human being encounters the Torah in a unique fashion, appropriate to his own unique soul. This profound internal counter between the soul of the individual and the Torah reveals to him new insights. So you can read it in its simple, based on simple reading and find great insights. That's what we're going to try to do. Okay, now, the method I'm going to use is uh, what's based on um, this book, Dat Mikra. Dat Mikra is this text. Let's see it on. Let's see. Yeah, now that you saw that, your life's complete. Yeah. But um, this is Dat Mikra. It's a, it's a wonderful text. And they basically, it's, it's, it's traditional. It's, it, it fits with um, like traditional thinking. Um, but they're not, they're, they're comfortable explaining the text based on what they say. Okay? They always try to kind of mix, blend it with tradition. Um, so it's not academic, but it's like somewhere in between. And so what they did is they said, I give up. I can't find any order in the text. And they basically said, this is a collection of 17 love songs. Right? So what I did for you, um, for myself, but for all of us. Okay. Um, I basically went through uh, 
it and I separated all it up into, um, I took, for instance, I, I'll show you, this is my text that I'm gonna be using here. I went, let me go all the way to the top. I, 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 uh, um, I basically listed all 17, I went through it and I separated it into 17 of their love songs in English. Okay, so you have this now. It's a helpful, and they basically, in each love song, they said it's a compilation of love songs. And in each song has kind of like a different theme or a different, different, um, a different like emphasis. And what, what I struggle with nevertheless, when I was reading, I was like, great, I have 17 love songs. What do I do with this? And so what I tried to do is I tried to see if there's certain layers in Shir Shirin. So I basically found 17 songs that they used. And then I try to see if they fit into overall categories. And I found like five categories. So that's what I want to present to you, like five central themes in Shir Shirin based on their splitting of the song into 17 separate songs. Does that make sense? Okay. So basically what I did was I read each of them, went through one, two, three, four. And I tried to find what's the central thing that's going on here? And does this fit with, um, with the other ones? And so basically I kind of made it, did it color coded. And I know it sounds like kind of like complicated, there's 17 songs and there's different categories, but you'll see that there's general themes in the text. And I wanna show you how I got there. And then I, th I think there's like some really central messages for us about love, about how to protect ourselves from like uh, the pitfalls of, um, of like a faulty connection or, 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 um, or how to strengthen our, our love for each other. And, um, and then we, and I think it's gonna, sh I'll be able to show you hopefully how it connects to cancer. Okay, so what, what I want to do right now is I want to kind of go through the text a little bit, show you a little, get a little feeling for um, the, the, what, uh, how I separated into separate themes. And then I want to show you uh, all the text together based on, on the themes. Okay? So you'll, you, if, if you don't understand right now, that's fine. I think you'll, fi you'll figure out what I'm, what I'm talking about in just a moment. Let's make this a little bit bigger. All right. So the first song is uh, one, chapter one, one to four. And they call it the Maiden to the Beloved. So I'm going to show you a few of these songs. I'm going to go to five of the 17, okay? We'll see them and you'll see how I kind of think that they're different from each other. Okay, so this one is, I colored this red. So I think it's just, this is an overall expression of like passionate love between a couple, okay? So um, it says like this, the song of songs, uh, oh, give me of the kisses of your mouth. Your love is more delightful than wine. Your ointments yield a sweet fragrance. Your name is like finest oil. Therefore, do maidens love you. So this is, this, this is the woman. There's a woman and a man. We don't know who they are. Um, some tradition might say that it's King Solomon. But if you read the simple text, it's not clear. It just says it's a, it's a maiden and a beloved. And they're seeking each other out. So here, what's important when you're reading it is trying to figure out who's speaking. So you hear the woman speaking. Give me other kisses of your mouth. Your love is more delightful than wine. Your ointments yield a sweet fragrance. Your name is like finest oil. Uh, sorry, this is the man. This should be the man's book. Mm -hmm. be the man's book. Your, Your name is, is like, right? Because he says, therefore do maidens love you. Oh, right, never mind. Okay. That should be the woman. Okay, I was right. Okay. Back and forth. Therefore do maidens love you. Draw me after you, let us run. This could be back and forth here. The king has brought me to his chambers, the woman saying, let us delight and rejoice in your love. Savor you more than wine. Like new wine, they love you. Okay, so we have here some statements of love between a man and a woman. Um, the next section is called the maiden to the daughters of Jerusalem. Okay, now I colored this blue. Why blue? I think this is a, like a cluster, part of a cluster, maybe six songs um, that talk about obstacles to love. Okay, so as I read this, perhaps you can see where an obstacle um, to the love uh, might, might be alluded to. And what I, what I think is valuable about this is like the red, blue, there's different colors. I think this is the depiction overall of love, a loving connection. There's ups and downs. And so I think the text is beautiful in that sense. It's not always perfect. There's ups and downs and there's struggles and there's work that they're putting in. So here's the text. This, this is um, it's only two verses, this song. Okay? Um, I am, this is the woman saying, I am dark but comely, O daughters of Jerusalem. So she's talking to the daughters of Jerusalem. Like the tents of Kedar, like the pavilions of Solomon. Don't stare at me because I'm swarthy. 
Because uh, right? the sun has gazed upon me. My mother's sons quarrel with me. They made me guard the vineyards. My own vineyard I did not guard. Okay, so what's happening here? I want to like, uh, I highlight the part I want to focus on. What do you think? Because like, if you think about this text, if you think about what I said, it might be like an obstacle to connection. What do you think is, the, what would be the obstacle? I see uh, Myra. Uh, okay. If you're going to take it, and I think you've done a commendable job with this, but when you're looking at it back and forth and you go and make believe that the, this is a song of Solomon and Bathsheba, she is coming in her caravan. She is dressed. She is. She comes with mirth. She comes with everything. It's described to kings and kings in uh, uh, Malachim. And then she comes to him, she is dark, she is calmly, she is stared at, mm -hmm. she's misunderstood. She's a queen wow. and she's coming, why? Because she knows King Solomon has the largest fleets and the greatest country. He is a supreme leader and she doesn't want him to invade her, but she in actuality is coming to him. And they're back and forth and back and forth. Uh, even, I would presume, even language does not necessarily mesh. So this is a language of interchange, of love, of trying to understand the other. And the obstacle is really, you're from here, I'm from there. Whether mm -hmm. it's what I'm saying or whether it's in a relationship. So that's a really, uh, it's really good and creative inter interpretation also. It takes it, it explains it based on the Solomon story. I'm taking a step back a little from the Solomon story and just reading it without that in mind. Um, and basically, I want to offer um, that this text is kind of hinting to um, a certain insecurity, like an insecurity in a relationship. Like I'm, she's basically saying like all the daughters of uh, the daughters of Jerusalem. Um, she's saying that I mean I'm dark. I'm not. I'm not worthy. Uh, uh, but but don't stare at me. Um, this, cause, cause I, I, this is not how I usually present. Um, I was out, I had to guard the vineyards. I got really dark. I mean, according to their, in their time, I guess that the dark was not a positive thing among her other, I guess, paler, uh, comrades, but like she's saying, like, this is not who I normally am. I don't look good. I'm not presenting properly. Um, uh, it's a certain insecurity. And so that's she's that's what she's sharing uh, with with the daughters of Jerusalem. So I think that this is hinting to like a component where, and I did not guard my own vineyard, like I didn't I didn't get to take care of myself properly. So sometimes that happens in a connection where um, where like uh, an individual feels a certain sense of insecurity, and that uh, hampers um, them from properly connecting with the other. I think that's like I think it's we start out with, with like a passionate love, and then a certain um, uh, step back from the love. Now, here's another one. Um, this is the next song. I just want to see a few of them, okay? The next song is like this. Conversations between the maiden and her beloved, uh, what is it? Beloved, does it say beloved? Oh, uh, the shepherd and her beloved, okay? So here's a conversation. So I, I think this is another, um, another obstacle. So now the woman, this is song number three. The woman says, tell me, you whom I love so well, where do you pasture your sheep? So now she finally approaches him. She comes up to you. Hey, uh, you who I love so well, where do you, where do you pass your sheep? Where do you rest them, them at noon? Let me not be as one who strays beside the flock of your fellows. So he, she's basically, I think she's basically trying to like come closer to him, make a connection, maybe making small talk. I don't know. Maybe come out to be where he is at work, be near him. But he didn't, I don't think he understood her properly. If you do not know a Pharisee woman, go follow the tracks of the sheep. Go, go, go find them. You can go find out where I, where I live. Go follow where I work. Go follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your kids by the tents of the shepherds. Meaning you want to know where I work. Go, go look, go look me up on Google. You'll find out where I work, but she's not saying that. So I think here's like a, another, I'm just trying to show you a few examples of, of how, how you can read this. This is another example, perhaps of a miscommunication. That's how I want to read it. So I mean, he's, she's trying to make a, a kind of make a uh, uh, step forward towards him, but he's not really grasping what she's trying to do. Okay, so that's like another, I would say another, that's why I call it a blue. Now here is what I would call, I call this another string. This is the yellow one, I, I call it a yellow. I found many examples of this, okay? And I'll show it to you in a moment. This, I would call this like a verbal flourish. 
a complement filler. And there's really like four or five of these throughout the text. And this is, this is a indicative of a, of a loving connection. If somebody's so in love, they're just constantly like this, uh, sharing positive comp uh, compliments with the other, they're praising them, they're, they're analyzing, they're saying, I love everything about you. And so here's an example of that. Um, so um, I have likened you, my darling, to a mare in Pharaoh's chariots. Okay, that's not the greatest compliment. Basically, <laughs> I've likened you to a horse. Okay, but um, but it's so this is this is what um, the man saying to her. But basically, uh, that is a positive thing in terms of strength, and he, and he keeps going. Now, basically, this is a flurry. This is different. It's not just an expression of their deep love. It's not an obstacle. But here's like a flurry of ex of expression, uh, a flurry of expressions of love. Your cheeks are are calmly plated wreaths are co calmly. Calmly is beautiful. Calmly, beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Um, your neck with strings of jewels. We will add wreaths of gold to your spangles of silver. The woman says back, while the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved to me is a bag of myrrh, lodged between my breasts. My beloved is to me is a spray of henna blooms, the man says, uh, from the vineyards of Engedi. Ah, you are fair, my darling. You are fair. Meaning, in Hebrew says you're pretty. She said it's a, you're, you're fair. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's really, you're fair, you're pretty. Um, with your dove-like eyes. And you, my beloved, are handsome, right? So having a, they're now they're like just like praising each other. They're, they're much more uh, kind of face to face, and they're just sharing loving words with each other. Beautiful indeed. Our couch is a, it's a bower, bower, bower. Our bower. Cedars are the beams of our house. Cypresses is the rafters. I am a rose of Sharon, Sharon, a lily of the valleys. The man says, like a lily among thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. Beautiful expression. Of that. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the years. I delight to sit in a shade, and his fruit is sweet to my mouth. This is just uh, expressions of love. Do you see any discussions of Am Yisrael and, and Hashem? No, but the, the al that could be the allegory, but simple reading doesn't really talk about them at all. You just read the text for what it says. Okay. Now here is, um, here's an I want to just show you another, um, another uh, strand here. And then we'll, I'll show you all the strands together. I think you get a bigger, better picture for the book. So, uh, these are all blue ones. It's like, I would say these are like all obstacles, but this is an interesting strand, King Solomon's marriage. I'm not gonna go into that. Um, here's some more praise for the bride. I wanna show you. Um, so here's a strand, I call this unitive text. And that's kind of like a, um, it's like a modest, way of saying that these are like, like provocative texts, okay? That's, these are texts that make, the I think, the rabbis uncomfortable want to explain it as an allegory. But the, the text basically, Shir Shirim basically like, sometimes they're together, sometimes they're not, sometimes they're seeking out each other, sometimes they're praising each other, sometimes there's great obstacles to them, to them being together. Sometimes they're together. Here's the text um, that describes that. Here. Um, okay. A garden locked is my own, my bride. A fountain locked, a sealed up spring. Your limbs are an orchard of pomegranates and of luscious fruits, oh, henna, of henna and of nard, nard and saffron. Fragrant reed and cinnamon, my, uh, with all for, uh, aromatic woods, myrrh and aloes, all the choice perfumes. You're a garden spring, a well of fresh water, a rill of Lebanon. Awake, O oh, north wind, come, O oh, south wind, blow upon my garden that its perfume may spread. Let my beloved come to his garden and enjoy its luscious fruits. I've come to my garden, my own bride. I've plucked my myrrh and spice, eat my honey and honeycomb, drunk my wine and my milk, eat lovers and drink, drink deep of wealth. Okay, so that's kind of like, uh, I would say like a, uh, I don't know, uncomfortable text for Rabbi to read. But, but like, basically that's why the rabbis explain this more as, a, as an allegory. But what I want to show you is that there's all kinds of types of texts, okay? So what I want to show you now, if you allow me uh, to do so. And even if you don't, I'm probably gonna show you anyway. But um, I wanna show you how I put these together kind of like in on our source sheet. Um, and, but, but before I do that, I just wanna ask if anybody has any like, uh, anybody's thinking of some, anything or they wanna share something about some of the texts that we saw so far. Okay, okay so let's see, these, let's see these together, okay? So I would say here's some passionate love this is the first strand, passion, love. And what I want to do, I want to keep in mind, is like, what's the point of all this while we're reading this? 
and uh, and then how's this connected to Passover? So that's how we're gonna. Okay. So here's a few texts connected to Passion Law. The first one we saw. Here's another one. I colored these all red. Okay. There's a few. Let me see how many there are. One, two, three. One, two, three. So here's the second one. Um, he brought me to the banquet room, and his banner of love was over me. So this is the woman saying this. This is uh, for chapter two, verse four to seven. This is another one of the 17 songs. Sustain me with raisin cakes, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. So she's 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 faint with love. His left hand was under my head. My right arm embraced his arm right arm embraced me. I jury you, made us in Jerusalem by gazelles with my hinds in the field. Do not wake or rouse love until it please. Okay, that's one. But later on in chapter eight, which is the last chapter, there's a description of like this powerful love that's like so powerful that it's just it's uh it's it's like um impossible to hold back. Who is that? She comes up from the desert, leaning upon her beloved. Under the apple tree, I roused you. It was there your mother conceived you. There she, she bore who conceived you. Let me be a seal upon your heart. Let the seal upon your hand. For love is fierce as death. Passion is mighty as Sha'ol. Its darts are darts of fire, a blazing flame. Right? It's a description of passionate love. Vast floods cannot quench love. It's a flame that cannot be quenched. Uh, nor rivers drown it. If a man offered all the wealth for love, he would be laughed to scorn. Okay, so this is, uh, I would say it's like a, a, a central theme of this passion of love. Okay, we talked about, um, we talked about the compliment flurries, right? And I showed you one of them. I just want to show you like one more. Then I want to show you uh, the strand of the obstacles to love. And I think that's kind of like where we're going to focus on uh, when a connection to Pesach and overall. So here's, uh, we saw this one. Um, we compared it to a, a horse, but uh, there's some more, there's some more positive ones, that, like uh, openly positive ones. Um, so praise for the bride. This is chapter four, uh, one to five, one. This is uh, the, the ninth song out of 17. So I just brought it here because it seemed like it matched with this theme of flurries of compliments. Oh, you are, are fair, my darling. Are you are fa- Ah, you are fair. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats <coughs> dreaming down out of blood. Your teeth are like a flock of, of you, ooze, right? Use, use, use. Uh, my Hebrew is better than my English sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of them bear twins, and not one loses a young. Your lips are like crimson thread. Your mouth is lovely. Your brow behind your veil uh, gleams like a pomegranate split open. Your neck is like the Tower of David. I'm just saying that on a shit of thing. Um, <laughs> built, uh, built to hold weapons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hung with a thousand shields, all the quibbles of words. Your breasts are like two fonts, twins of a gazelle, browsing among the lilies. When the day glows, blows gently and the shadows flee, I will be taking me to the mountain of myrrh, uh, to the hill of frankincense. Every part of you, my dog, is fair, my darling. There's no blemish in you. This keeps... Right? There's something beautiful that you're saying here. If yeah. you can just, if we can take the Hebrew and just I mean, the God element is always in here. It's always in here. It's threaded throughout. But the reality, the other reality is that why would they put it in the Tanakh when they were fighting so much over it? You know, it's not sacrilegious. It's all- yeah. The wedding songs as well. These are love poetry. So lo- these are notes that the teenagers get- are passing to one another. I, all of these things so are there. For me, I agree with you. For me, what I struggle with is like, when something gets put in the Tanakh, it has like it's got to have a meaning. Yeah, like if you correct. So if you read this as like these are beautiful, like this could be a secular love songs uh, between uh, between a couple, or you can hear this perhaps on the radio, maybe with like the lyrics would be a little bit um, what about like Jewish adapted. Stuff? But what about Jewish stuff? So, so that's the question. So like, how can you? How do you make this? How do you make this Jewish? I'm going to offer a path to do that <laughs> to see why it would kind of fit in with our tradition. But, um, but if you just read this and it's based on a simple reading, it's a little bit hard to see how this like fits with your other books of the Tanakh. That's why the rabbis went like to a whole other, the whole other direction in saying this is Am Yisrael, this is Hashem, this is the Torah. I understand that. I'm going to offer somewhere in between uh, as we are they, go. Are they doing that because we're talking about the king? The king is Hashem. Yes. Okay. Where he, right now we're talking about King Solomon. Where where does it say King here? Well, would you refer? Uh, to, he you gets refer, mentioned. You refer, you refer, it gets the, mentioned. We assume but, that the text is written by King Solomon. Right. The songs are, are composed or or, or, or brought together by King Solomon. However, he he is like an editor, a redactor, or an author. 
Um, but the text of the songs themselves uh, don't all mention King Solomon. It's just like a love song between a maiden and a beloved. See, see, I, I understand what you're saying, though. You know, why was this kind of indoctrinated into the Tanakh when it really has nothing to do with it? That's the question. I'm happy that you. Yeah, I'm happy that that's bothering. Yeah. That is the question. So yeah. the sage's answer is because it's an allegory. Art scroll says you, you, it's an allegory. Rabbi Norman yeah. Lamb, Rabbi Solvage, you have to read it as an allegory. That is how you read it. But there's so many allegories in, in the world today. Why didn't they get all put into their proper place if you were going to take that kind of position? That's a good question. That's so I'm I'm gonna off, so I'm going to offer a, a path, an intermediate okay. path, to okay. kind of that's see how... I, that's why I was saying that what do you do with these beautiful pieces of poetry? Do you write them out of our history or do you put them into our history? I mean, there's so and many texts that not, did not get in. There's so many the, the Maccabee. I know there's so many other texts that were written. I mean, there's many. The Tanakh also says, "Check out this text. Check out that." So we don't even know where they are anymore. Like, there's a lot of texts that were written that didn't make it in. So this made it in. Uh, I'll, I'll, so we'll see. The, the, the rabbi said it made it in because it's it's a very beautiful allegory. And if, truth is, I'm again, I'm 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 saying, if you read the text, just read the English and the art scroll. It's really beautiful. It's a Shem seeking us and us seeking a Shem. It's a really beautiful thing. It's empowering for me. It strengthens me. If it strengthens my connection to a Shem. Uh, yeah, Rick I, is shaking his head. I don't see that connection. I'm, what I'm saying is, if you read it as an allegory, if you yeah. read the simple reading of it, that's another thing. But as an allegory, I feel like it's powerful. I'm going to offer a way to read the text based on the simple reading as well. Is uh, it, it could be God looking at his creatures and the, the love that they have for each other. Mm -hmm. It could no, be. I thought the same. It could be. Yeah, that 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 that's much less. That's not so much. Helpful. Correct. So it's reflections on love. But what's the message? Is, just, just. If God, God looks over. It's another way of God looking over his his people. This is the connection between his people, between a man and a woman. I mean. And, but is, so it's just a, it's a descript it's descriptive or is it prescriptive? What I mean by that is just describing loving relationships, or is there some sort of prescription like what do I have to do with this? What can I take? To, uh, my sense of Tanakh usually Tanakh is not a history text, although it brings history, but it brings things for a purpose to prescribe to you how to live. So, like, what would be like the if you agree with that premise? Then, what would be the prescription? God, if, God, if God gave us the ability to have loving relationships mm -hmm. so that's kind of the direction i'm, I'm going um i'll just already say like i think the text um i think the text is guiding us um to how to build a positive connection with each other at least the first stage is like this is the romantic stage of love and it's go it describes in the text like five or so obstacles to to the manifestation of that love and i think that it's kind of like a guide in a way if you're able to find the different layers in it of of how to manifest like romantic love. It's not really, it's not really like a relationship or a relationship love. It's more like a, a romantic component of that love. Uh, there's other texts which describe other types of love, um, but it also is a guide to how, how to protect ourselves from obstacles to that love. Cause that's really the back and forth of the text. So I'm going to show you with the next strand, some of those, um, some of those obstacles. And that's why, and I, and I think that's kind of like a, the connection to Passover. I'm already telling you, because uh, we have 13 minutes left. Um, but the, the connection to Passover is that Passover is all about removing comments. It's removing uh, obstacles to our connection to Judaism, to Hashem. And I think the text is heavily focused on that. It's showing like how things, uh, how is, is there's unbridled love. It's very passionate. If you do not know how to channel it the right way, um, and you and you and you fall into these obstacles to the expression uh, to the expression of that love. Um, then you're in a place of chametz. You're in a place of disconnect from Hashem. Passover is about removing all of the things that disconnect us to Hashem, really being able to embrace our beloved, which is Hashem. And so that's why I think we read on Passover. I think the text is basically a guide um, for us being able to manifest that passionate love, that 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 love that uh, the waters cannot quench. Um, so I, I'm going to show that to you with the next thread. Okay. The next strand. So we read some of this. These are more flurries. There's another flurry. The maiden is unique. Among, this is this is uh, song number eleven. Okay. Well, let's get to um, <clears throat> let's get to uh, this thread here. This is the dance song. Also, he's basically seeing her dancing. He's like, oh, you're. Uh, and he's, he's basically praising her from her toes to her head while she's dancing. Okay. It's another type of praise. This is um, this is uh, song number twelve. 
okay? They're very similar. That's why I think they're all one strand. Okay, here's the third one, uh, the unitive text. So we read one of them. These are like the texts which actually describe them finally being together after the things keep them separate. Here they're together. It's not just the passion, inner love. It's not just um, the flur, the compliments. They're actually physically together. And this is what probably led to some discomfort, these, these texts. There's two of them. Well, here's what I want to focus on is the blue ones. Okay, I sought him but found him not. Obstacles to the connection. So here's the first one, okay? And I, I kind of went by the order of the text, but I'm going to take three of them in relation to Passover to focus on. Okay. The first one is um, this song number. Oh. Oh, yeah. Sorry if people are getting busy from this. Bob, especially. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, this is chapter. This is song number seven. Okay. This is basically, I would say, it's an introduction to this, or perhaps this is like um, somebody not being able to manifest. They have like everything. This could be an obstacle. This idea of like having dreams about somebody. But not being able to fulfill them. This could be an introduction to the obstacles overall, or perhaps you could, perhaps we can tease this out a little bit if we have more time. But um, upon my couch at night in a dream, okay, she's dreaming about him, but she can't. I saw it, the one I love, I saw it, but found him not. This is different than the other ones, right? I must rise and roam the town through the streets and through the squares. I must seek the one I love. I saw him, but found him not. I mean, like she's basically sitting, she can't find him. It's kind of like introduction to the other ones. Um, the watchman met me. I met the watchman who patrolled the town. Have you seen the one I love? This is all in her dream. Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one I love. I held him fast. I would not let him go till I brought him to my mother's house, chamber of her, of her who conceived me. I adjure you, made as Jerusalem by gazelles and by hinds of the field. Do not wake or arouse. Love until it please. Okay, she, she was seeking him out. She finally found him. But this idea of like not being able to find, uh, not being able to fulfill your dream, having certain desires, not, not succeeding to like, really um, bring it to fruition. That could be an overall struggle, or it could be an introduction to these upcoming ones. Here, here's the first one. We mentioned this. We read this together. Self-doubt. Okay. Uh, I am dark, but calmly. We read this. Um, like the tense of Kedar. Don't stare at me because I'm uh, swarthy, because the sun has gazed upon me. So, Dat Mikra, uh, this is one we read, right? Dat Mikra explains it this way. This is, I brought this here, um, but I'm not going to read it, the full thing. But basically, he says, like, uh, like I'm not dark. Uh, I, I'm only temporarily dark. Uh, I'm not. I wasn't born that way. I know it's like uncomfortable text, but because of the sun, I became dark, and I became like not like you, or, or in her mind, she became un, unattractive. Um, and, but but really, I'm not like that. Meaning, a certain. It's a certain. Um, she's feeling insecure, and certain insecurities sometimes can make it difficult. To really manifest your love. Here's another one um, that, that the, the text talks about. We mentioned communication. Communication is very key. This is the one we, we read this already together. This is an early text, a uh, early song. Um, she went to go see. Where are you? Uh, hey, where do you work? And he's basically like, ah, oh, hey, go go Google me. No, she was trying to come close to him. You didn't get her uh, her her suggestion or what she's trying to um, tell you. So this communication struggles. Um, here's a very important one. Okay. Uh, and this text is really beautiful, um, how Dat Mikra, again, um, uh, this text, how he explains this, because you, you, you might not have read it this way uh, by reading the simple reading of it. But um, here, basically, sometimes in a relationship, um, you're very connected, you have that inner love, but you're very distracted. You're distracted with work, you're distracted with your problems, you're distracted with uh, so many things around you. And we're going to see that in this text. This, this song here, um, yeah, basically, uh, she really wants, uh, he really wants to be with her, um, but she can't be with him because she's preoccupied. And sometimes that happens uh, in connection where there is that love, but you just kind of forget, um, forget to, to, to work on it because you're so preoccupied. So here's the text. Um, there he comes, leaping over mountains. So he's coming towards her. He's leaping over mountains, right? Like Superman. Um, bounding over hills, right? It sounds, uh, my beloved is like a gazelle or like a young stag. There he stands behind her wall. He's waiting behind the wall, okay? Gazing through the window, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke thus to me. Arise, my darling. Right? So he's coming after her. He's seeking after her. My fair one, come away. For now the winter has passed. The rains are over and gone. The, the blossoms have appeared in the land. The time of pruning has come. Um, the song of the turtle was heard in our land. The green figs, etc. My fair one, come away. 
Oh, Dove in the cranny of the rock, she says. Um, uh, he says, come in. So she's basically hiding from him. Oh, Dove in the cranny of the rock, hidden by the cliff. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Where are you? I can't see you. I'm, I, I've come all the way to, towards you. Where are you? I can't, I can't see you. You're, uh, for your voice is sweet, I want to hear it. And, you're, and your face is calmly. So she says, so this is the answer. This is how Dami Cry explains this. It says, catch us the foxes. She answers like this, right? She goes, oh, my beloved, you are like, uh, you're like a horse or you're, I don't know. But she doesn't say that. What does she say? Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards. Meaning, I have so much work to do right now. I can't. I don't, I, I'm very busy right now. I have so much stuff to do at work. I'm, I'm overburdened. I mean, he's coming towards her, but she can't see it. Sometimes that happens in a connection where, um, with Hashem also as well. Hashem wants our love. Hashem wants our connection. We're busy. We're busy at work. We're busy uh, We're busy with everything we're engaged in. It happens in a connection as well. So her answer, Korna Dami Kra, is, I can't. I can't come. He's like, why do you want to hear your voice? I, I don't have time. I don't have energy to give you my voice because I'm, over, I'm, I'm, I'm very busy at, at, with my work, with my engagements. And so they're ruining the vineyards. For our vineyard is in blossom. My beloved is my... But I, I still um, feel very close to you. My beloved is mine and I'm his. I think that's the verse here. My beloved. I, no, this is actually Dodi Lee. There is that verse too, but that's not this one. It's similar. Um, uh, when the day, when the day uh, and the shadows, um, when the shadows flee, set out my beloved to the gazelle, young stag, the hill of spices. Um, basically, uh, Right now, I can't, I can't be with you, uh, but I really love, we, we, I really do love you. So that is a, that's a big uh, obstacle to, to connection is like this being overburdened or overworked or being, uh, being distracted. Um, I want to show you one. It's a really, it's a really nice one as well. So you have to kind of like read the text. This is a, this is another one of the songs. You have to find these songs as you read. This is song number 10. This is so powerful. And Rob, Rabbi Soloveitchik, uses this as, a, um, as an allegory for Hashem uh, seeking us. Um, it's Hashem coming and knocking on our door. And uh, he says that Hashem, she says in our days, Hashem, in his days, Hashem was knocking uh, with all six knocks, he says. And Hashem's knocking on our door. Uh, Hashem's not completely in the door. He says the, he says the redemption's coming. Hashem's knocking. He brought six knocks of Hashem. And he's basically saying that Hashem is giving us indications that the, that the, that the um, redemption is coming. He uses it as an allegory. But if let's read this simply, basically you have a case where um, a guy comes to a woman and, uh, and, and he's all excited to be, to be together with her, to, to spend time with her. And he's waiting outside in the cold. And he's knocking at the door, let me in. Let's see what her response is. Um, I was asleep, but my heart was wakeful. Hark, my beloved knocks. Okay, she's asleep. She's in her house. She has, uh, a, you know, the heat on under the nice comforter. It's very warm and comfy. All of a sudden, she hears him knocking. Okay, um, he goes, "Let me in, my own, my darling, my faultless, faultless love." For my head is drenched with dew. I Meaning, it's wet out here. It might be raining. It might be very cold. He's waiting outside. She's inside in the warmth. Right. Um, my locks with the damp of night. It's cold out here. Let me in. She goes, "I had taken off my robe. Was I to don it again? I'm just so comfy in here." I just took off my robe. I just got, I just got my pajamas. I just took off my makeup or whatever. I just got comfortable. Am I going to step outside and, and come into the cold? I, I bathed my feet. Was I to soil them again? I just took a bath. I'm, I'm going to come outside and get all dirty. Uh, my beloved took his hand off the left. So what happened? He took his hand off the left. It's cold out there. He had to leave. And my heart was stirred for him. I rose to, I rose to, so I took up. Uh, all right. My beloved took his hand off the latch. My heart was stirred for him. So she, oh, he's going to leave, right? I rose to let my, my beloved, my hands drip, drip myrrh, my fingers flowing myrrh upon the handles of the bowl. I opened the door for my beloved, okay? She finally got up. She got out of bed. What happened? My beloved had turned and gone. He left, right? Uh, I was faint because of what he said. I saw him, found him not. I called, but he did not answer. I met the, so she goes out, she meets the watchman, et cetera. But basically, I would say this, sometimes there's something that's a component of complacency in a relationship. Where, where, or, or laziness, however you want to explain it, where you're in a connection and uh, it's not comfortable, not comfortable. So people mention, you know, it's about work, putting the work in. Um, so that is, this is perhaps indicative of, of the other side of that, where um, he's coming, he's, he's coming towards her, uh, but she doesn't, she only realized that after um, he left.
and, and because she was comfortable where she was. And this could be physically comfortable, there's all kinds of comforts that sometimes we find ourselves in, and we sometimes have to step out of our comfort zone uh, to be with the other. So I wanna show you one more here in this, in this thread, and then I'll connect it to Pesach, because we have like uh, four minutes left, right? Uh, okay. Um, well, let's just stop, stop there. Let's connect this to Passover. Okay, there's one more strand, um, which I say I think this ends the book, which is like uh, the last chapter. Um, basically, brings a few hints to how to um, settle into the relationship beyond all this romantic up and down and flurries and back and forth. Um, it brings a few components. Basically, shows how uh, how they're. Um, I'm able to describe this right now, but like how um, she finds herself happy with who she has. And that's like a, an important piece to like a, like a lasting relationship. But the main, the text really is about romantic love, passionate romantic love with this ups and downs and the obstacles to that love. Now, how is this connected to Passover? Um, so the first uh, connection is um, self-doubt. Sometimes we, um, um, Hashem came to save Am Yisrael in Egypt, and Am Yisrael didn't believe that Hashem would, would be able to save them, right? Um, they were working so hard, and Moshe says, Hashem's going to save you. They doubted uh, that that could even happen. And so that, and Hashem had to do all these miracles um, to strengthen their faith in Hashem. So that's one connection to Passover, this idea that like um, in a connection, sometimes you can have doubts, and those doubts can, can cripple you uh, to the point that you don't think you're, you're worthy of being redeemed or loved. And uh, I'm so, because of all they went through in Egypt, they felt that. They felt that they weren't worthy of being redeemed. And Hashem had to do so much to show them that they were. So this is like one, one, one like obstacle to, to a connection. We saw it in the book, right? We saw it with, um, with her saying that I'm, I'm dark and I'm not, I'm not worthy in, in how she was explaining it. And this is how a, a connection to Passover. Um, here's one more connection. Uh, we're taking three, three of the obstacles. Um, so, um, Mr. Yashirim says that Pharaoh made Am Yisrael work in Egypt. It wasn't just because he wanted the pyramids. It's because he wanted to occupy their minds. He wanted to occupy their minds to the point that they wouldn't escape, that they wouldn't have faith in Hashem, they wouldn't be able to, to, to pivot to their religion. He wanted to keep them busy. And so he says, and so I think this is another component of our disconnect from Hashem our, and our ability to connect to Hashem in Passover by like, by removing, the, by removing the, the, our our burdens and being able to make space for Hashem. And this, I think was talked about in the book as well with um, when she's like, Oh, um, he's coming, he's hopping over the Hills. And she's like, listen, I'm busy. I have all these foxes to take care of. And, and everybody is busy in their lives, but if, when it's taken to the extreme, it can make it difficult to, to connect properly. And the final one um, is complacency, um, which you talked about with, oh, he came, he knocked on the door. It's cold outside. It's wet. He said, oh, I just took off my robe. So um, this text connects chametz to laziness. Um, and she basically says, Egyptian culture corrupted them so thoroughly. We were told the Jewish people were on the 49th level of Tuma. And even if they tarried the slightest bit, they would have missed their window. Um, so, so basically, um, uh, the bread, uh, chametz is the bread of action and alacrity. When the children of Israel were they had no moment to waste, meaning... Chametz points to action. When they left Egypt, um, they, they ate Chametz, and that points to action, but seizing the moment and seizing the opportunities. And so uh, I think this also is a component of getting rid of our Chametz on Passover, getting rid of our laziness so we can properly connect to Hashem. So to sum it all up, okay, sheer Song of Songs. Let's take this off here. Um, Song of Songs is a, is a tough text um, on multiple levels. It's kind of, if you accept that there are 17 songs in here, it's hard to make order of them, okay? And it's a tough text because it's kind of hard to understand how it fits into our tradition, our traditional texts. Um, therefore, some, our tradition explained it as an allegory. I'm offering a different way to explain it, basically as a guide um, to, to expression of romantic and passionate love and <coughs> obstacles that, are, that sometimes can, can, can hamper or distract us from um, that love. And, uh, and I think the text is guiding us, uh, uh, guiding us through that and offering certain obstacles so we can keep them in mind. And as we head towards Passover, perhaps we read this text because we want to rekindle that love each year. And uh, there's certain things that can withhold us from, from the expression of that love. 
And Passover is like the beginning, <laughs> the beginning of the season. It's the first year in the, in the calendar in the Tanakh. And so perhaps it's, that's the time for that, like that romantic, passionate love, that rekindling of the connection. And there, these are some ways to kind of like strengthen that passion on, on Pesach. Uh, without referring to Pesach, it does refer to spring. And that time that of the year, you well. know, it's, it's the voice of it's the turtle dove, not the turtle. Turtles don't, uh, you know, say. So uh, it, you... it is about spring. And Pesach is about spring. And so, lots of it. Correct. Right. That's a good point. Just to answer Sherry and Rick, that's how I think it's Jewish. In the sense of like, I, okay, you're, you're shaking your Okay, we'll talk about it. But I think that it's I'm not, not just, it's not, you, well, let me finish, 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 finish the thought for a second. I'll tell you where I have a, a Let me finish this thought for a second. One it's not, let, let me finish. I may, I may be talking the same thing. So let me say it first. Every time the rabbis, every time the rabbis translate this. This is an obstacle to our, uh, no, I know, I, I apologize. Yeah. But, you know, it's only, it's only when, when the rabbis get the opportunity to translate this, does we then all of a sudden make that transition to truly understand so what this rabbi is saying is that I'm not saying, I'm not explaining as an allegory. I'm explaining this as a love story. I'm explaining this as there's pitfalls, there's obstacles, there's times of connection. You can read it like that. And I think it fits well with our, our tradition. There's descriptions of this in connection to Passover. And overall, the a motif in Judaism is just try to have strong, healthy relationships. So I think that in addition to depicting love between people, I think it depicts uh, uh, like the ups and downs of relationships. It depicts some pitfalls and some obstacles to connection. I think it can be a guide for us to strengthening our, our relationship with our spouses and with others. So I think even without reading as Amisrael and the Torah, I think there's great wisdom to be taken from it, not just as a, 